Welcome. This is our first live event since November 2019, and I am so thrilled to see people. Um, the talk today, so I, I have a few things to connect here, including this exhibit, which surreptitiously opens today. There's a story behind that, but um, I'll just give you a little bit of the details. The talk today is the first in what I hope will be an ongoing colloquium series in other semesters um, on research relating to Latin America and New Orleans. So I wanted to give a little bit of context as to where this comes from and situate the library and our role in this. So New Orleans, of course, was part of the Spanish Empire in the 18th century, beginning in the 18th century, or in the 18th century. Latin Americans, especially those like me who are from the Caribbean and come to the city for the first time, are struck by its Latinness, its Caribbeanness, even if at first we're not sure how to articulate or understand uh, what we're perceiving and what we're feeling. This is quite striking because it's a city that famously looks uh, to its French and not its Spanish colonial roots, let alone does it recognize its strong commercial ties and cultural ties with Latin America that can be traced to the early 19th century at least. For the last maybe 15 years, this has been changing. I have no doubt that Hurricane Katrina in 2005 uh, that devastated the city was also a catalyst since the hurricane brought Mexican, <coughs> Brazilian, and other Latin American workers to rebuild, and many have remained. Um, for many reasons, including Hurricane Katrina, there is a growing body of work that reflects more interest in the city's Latin American connections in this period of time, even to explain New Orleans' uniqueness by inserting it within a comparative Gulf or Caribbean context. If we look at that more recent history, we find that since at least the 1920s, the city of New Orleans was involved in a concerted effort to become the gateway of the Americas, which I think Marilyn is going to touch on. In the words of one of its main promoters, Mayor Shep Morrison, the story of the rise and fall of these efforts, which included, um, oops, I left the Spanish in here, meaning to translate gestiones, efforts, uh, not only of the mayor's office, through successive administrations, but also the Chamber of Commerce, the Port of New Orleans, and many other administrative centers around the city, that story has not been told. Our contribution, meaning the Latin American Library's contribution, um, to furthering uh, our understanding of this history is to document the life and work of Latin Americans who settled in New Orleans from the early 20th century to the present. As some of you know, we have many um, different uh, magazines, newspapers, ephemeral publications that attest to, to that present. Um, but I just wanted to touch very briefly on uh, some notable donations that we've received recently um, some of which are not even cataloged or available yet, but one of them is the Pan American Life Insurance Group Archive, and that was our last uh, meeting here. We had an exhibit opening and an exhibit that seemed to last forever because we left it through the pandemic. And that is, has been the major employer in Latin America, uh, in New Orleans, where uh, many Latin Americans in the city have uh, worked. We received recently um, the papers of Margarita Gutierrez Najera. She is the daughter of renowned 19th century Mexican writer Manuel Gutierrez Najera. 
and she settled in New Orleans in the 1920s. She studied at Loyola and also wrote a column on Latin American issues uh, for local newspapers. This was a donation of Terry Bible, her uh, granddaughter, and their family. Recently, I have also been offered and uh, we are uh, ready to uh, consummate that um, transaction. The papers of Ricardo Apardo Sr., a Cuban emigre activist within the Cuban exile community here in New Orleans. Um, he, his papers will be coming to the Latin American Library. He worked in media here and had a Sunday segment, this is mid 20th century, on news about the local uh, Latin American community. Um, this was a gift of um, uh, Maria Pardo Huete and her family. So these are all examples of how we are documenting this history. Um, so just very briefly before moving on to the main event, I just wanted to encourage you to take a look. Afterwards, well, I invite you to uh, have something to drink and to eat. And I hope you visit our exhibit that there is a very long story as to why this exhibit is taking place today, but it has to do with COVID and a canceled event, and you can um, fill in the dots. But we're thrilled, and there is a connection, actually. The connection is that because the, one of the reasons, or the main reason why this library uh, is so strong in Central American materials has to do precisely with the historical and commercial ties between the city uh, and uh, the region and also of Tulane. So it's, it's all connected. So now, uh, please take a program. They're outside. All right. So I am thrilled to present our first speaker in the series, Marilyn Grace Miller, um, who will share ongoing research into one mid-century episode <clears throat> excuse me, of this largely untold history of New Orleans and Latin America with a talk titled Lament of the Libertadores, Monumental Deba Demise in New Orleans' Garden of the Americas. Marilyn Miller is professor of Latin American literature and culture in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese here at Tulane and Sizzler, Sizzler? Seisler, Professor in Judaic Studies uh, at Tulane. Marilyn's work focuses on issues of race, slavery, and Jewish identity in inter-American contexts. She's the author of um, <clears throat> Rise and Fall of the Cosmic Race, the Cult of Mestizaje in Latin America, and editor of the volume uh, Tango Lessons, Movement, Sound, Image, and Text, in contemporary practice. Marilyn's focus on New Orleans and Latin America is not new. Um, she wrote Allá en Tierras del Sur, Horror and Recoil, in Jose Martí's New Orleans uh, on Martí's views of the American South as a warning to Latin American readers. This was published in the Global South in 2019. She's also the author of an excellent book Port of No Return, Enemy Alien Internment in World War II New Orleans that just came out last year from LSU Press. And it has been nominated for the Louisiana Endowment for Humanities Book of the Year Award. Congrats. Research on that book has been featured in the radio programs Tripod, New Orleans at 300, and Latino USA. She's currently completing a study, a study of the works of Guatemalan author Eduardo Alfon, Halfon, Halfon, forthcoming from Vanderbilt University Press. And now, le doy la palabra a Marily. So thank you so much to Hortensia, to 
Rachel, to all the other um, kindred souls in the Latin American Library, it's really a pleasure to, to come here and speak to you all today in this inaugural series. And uh, um, Hortensia said, ongoing research. This is really incipient research more than ongoing research. Um, but in any case, I would like to start by asking how many of you know anything about the Garden of the Americas? Right on, right on, all right. We're, we're, we're doing what we need to be doing then, uh, talking about something that's new and, and fresh and um, forgotten at the same time. So in this new research endeavor, I'm exploring one very weighty example of New Orleans' efforts to highlight and enhance its partnerships with Latin America and the Caribbean in the long decade between 1955 and 1966. Um, see which is going to work better here. Can you all see this? Can you, can you see the screen? Because this, this is really uh, image driven. If you can't see it and you can, there's a couple seats up here that are closer or is, can we tilt this at all or is there a better, is there, is this, it's okay? You, you can all see it? Great. So during this decade, three large statues of Latin American independence heroes, Simón Bolívar, 1957, Benito Juárez, and Francisco Morazán, 1965 and 66, were installed on the neutral ground of Basin Street between Canal and St. Louis following the demolition of the Southern Railway Terminal in 1955. Basin Street, running parallel to Rampart, just one block from Rampart, once served, as many of you know, as a dividing line between the French Quarter and Storyville, distinguishing the front of town from back of town, associated, back of town, of course, associated with the Lumpen uh, sector of the city. The monumental project, dubbed the Garden of the Americas, reflected New Orleans' many historic engagements with Latin America, but also testified to new efforts to deepen diplomatic, commercial, and cultural ties between the two regions. Designed as part of a citywide beautification project, the Garden of the Americas touted the historical connections between New Orleans as a city that once formed part of Spain's colonial domination, do, dominions by foregrounding three Spanish American leaders whose independent struggles together spanned the regions of North, Central, and South America. But how many New Orleanians pay attention to the Garden of the Americas? <laughs> Obviously not a lot. Um, or even are aware of it. How many students and scholars of Latin America know of the Garden of the Americas? How many visitors to the city consider its importance even as they visit Marie Laveau's tomb in the adjacent St. Louis Number 1 Cemetery? In comparison, how many New Orleanians, Tulanians, historians, visitors know of Lee Circle and the Confederate Monuments controversy. So the community deliberations and events around these installations provide us with a sense of the depth of interest and enthusiasm in these inter-American alliances. For the occasion of the dedication of the statue of El Libertador Simón Bolívar in November of 1957, for example, a large contingent of Latin American diplomats and businessmen hobnobbed with local political personalities during the inaugural speech by the Venezuelan Minister of Health, a speech that was translated and reproduced in a fancy edition for those in attendance. It wasn't just a big statue, Times Picayune columnist Mike Scott explains. It was a big affair, the kind of weekend long to-do that included a special mass at St. Louis Cathedral, a luncheon for visiting Venezuelan dignitaries aboard the dock board yacht, the Good Neighbor. For real, there was a yacht called the Good Neighbor. Um, publication of a special section of the New Orleans item and a pre-unveiling un, pre military parade down Canal Street. What could be more symbolic than New Orleans civic leaders and a group of Latin American dignitaries having lunch together aboard a boat named the Good Neighbor? Or attending mass together at St. Louis Cathedral next to the Cabildo and fronting Jackson Square, known during the Spanish colonial era, of course, as the Plaza de Armas. I think Scott may be wrong about the lunch party on the Good Neighbor consisting entirely of Venezuelan dignitaries, though. Many of the activities, um, you can see here, for example, there's a, there's a list of dignitaries here on the, on the right top, and then there's a, 
this image on the left uh, is the is the address that the Venezuelan Minister of Health gave at the Bolivar unveiling. Many of the activities around the dedication of the Bolivar statue were sponsored and planned by members of the Bolivarian Society of Louisiana, based in New Orleans, some of whose names appear on the image in the right corner of this slide, including Adolfo Egewish, Egewish, president, and Mario Bermudez, secretary. Hegewish, born in Veracruz, Mexico in 1878, had immigrated to New Orleans in 1923. Bermudez was a native of Colombia who served as director of international relations for the city for several years, as well as for the International House. So it seems that the Bolivarian Society was a kind of pan-American social aid and pleasure club that, at least for a time, wielded a powerful hand in the city politics and social life. It was Hegewish, for example, who decided where the Bolivar statue would stand even before the rail terminal on Basin was demolished in 1955. And as we see from the image in the right corner, besides Hegewish and Bermudez, the Bolivarian Society counted among its honorary members the governor of Louisiana, the mayor of New Orleans, and the consuls general of Venezuela, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, and Panama. So the larger project of the Garden of the Americas in which these three statues were inserted was a multilingual, mid-century gambit to foreground and enhance New Orleans' role as a hub of interaction with its neighbors in the other Americas. That role had expanded during the World War II period with the increased circulation of peoples, war equipment, and other supplies through New Orleans port. Uh, and local leaders wanted to hold on to that expansion and the revenue and commercial opportunities it represented. And I should point out that while these efforts to link New Orleans to the rest of the world were often cast in the 50s and the 60s as international or global, there was nonetheless a prominent focus on ties to and circulation with Latin America, Central and South America in particular. This focus, or bias if you will, is very apparent in a publication from the era touting the International House as a, quote, nonprofit clearinghouse and meeting place for revisiting Latin American businessmen founded in 1943. The front cover, that's the image on the left, of this undated magazine casts New Orleans as a world trade center in several languages with English and Spanish, Spanish appearing first and second. And on the back cover, under the banner, the world comes to New Orleans, New Orleans serves the world, that's the globe uh, image. A map situates the Americas front and center in a depiction of global circulation in which Europe and other regions have basically disappeared. So inside the magazine, we find evidence that the International House was about more than trade. The caption for the image on the right, this one of the uh, super madmen looking students, um, caption on the, for the image on the right explains that it also administered the Cordell Hull Foundation, helping talented Central and South American students attend US universities. These medical students are enrolled through the foundation at Tulane University Medical School. So there were, very, there were many other signs of this inter-American rapport and interaction in the decade I am focusing on in relation to the Garden of the Americas. In, this, in these ephemeral items from the archives of Mayor Morrison at the New Orleans Public Library, we have at top left a pamphlet from International Week held October 12th to 18th, 1958, here in New Orleans. To the right of it, um, you can see the, the um, cablegram from Mayor Morrison, gen dated January 27th, 1956, accepting the invitation for New Orleans Queen of Carnival to participate in carnival festivities in Caracas. Complacido informarles, Reina Carnaval, Nueva Orleans, acepta honrosa invitación a representar nuestra ciudad, festividades, ciudad, amiga, stop. Nuestra gentil embajadora y comitiva partirán para Caracas, febrero 11, stop. Carroza alegórica, Nueva Orleans, lista viajar, febrero 3, stop. Como siempre, lazos unen nuestras ciudades y pueblos. This is not the only carnival diplomacy practiced here in New Orleans, by the way. According to Dennis Woltering's new documentary, Blaine Kern, they call him Mr. Mardi Gras. 
Blaine Kern Sr. traveled to Cuba in 1959 with an entourage of other carnival personalities and New Orleans sent a very large float on a barge to Havana. I found references to this trip in the Morrison papers at the New Orleans Public Library. I'm still looking for more details. Uh, Kern apparently didn't have nice things to say about Fidel Castro. There was something about the, the float was too big and they had to tear down a wall or something. I don't know. But, uh, but I just think it's hilarious that in 1959, Blaine Kern was in Cuba with, Carna with a New Orleans Carnival. So. On the bottom right, we have a pamphlet publicizing a series of inter-American seminars and town meetings to be held in New York in 1958 in cooperation with New Orleans International House. And on the bottom left, a pennant announcing the inaugural direct flight between New Orleans, Maracaibo, and Caracas on Linea Aeropostal Venezolana. These items all suggest a context in which the Garden of the Americas initiative was not an anomaly or an oddity but rather a, rea a realization or, or enactment of New Orleans' vision of itself as fundamentally Latin and inter-American. Today, though, this vision or version of New Orleans as a hub for political, commercial, educational, and cultural interconnectivity with the other Americas seems to have waned. You can still find International House in the Central Business District, but it's now just a boutique hotel with, a few, with few remnants of its earlier role as a haven for international visitors, particularly those from Latin America. No one seems to know what happened to the multilingual library with over 10,000 titles that the International House boasted about in its glossy magazine. And over on Basin Street, the statues of Bolivar, Juarez, and Morazan still preside over the Garden of the Americas but these memorials were notably not part of the recent fracas over which of the city's monuments should stay up and which should come down, a debate that drew international attention and resulted in the removal of four figures associated with the Confederacy. While all that was happening, the Garden of the Americas continued to suffer neglect, decay, and perhaps most notably, indifference. Despite its proximity to important landmarks such as Armstrong Park, Congo Square, St. Louis No. 1, as well as to the French Quarter itself, it's hard to even imagine this historic stretch of Basin Street as a garden-like oasis that invites us to stroll its symbolic paths. Some wonder what these monuments are even doing in New Orleans. In July 19, in a July 19 column, July 2019 column for the Times-Picayune NOLA.com, Mike Scott responded to this very question from one of his readers. Why do we have or need a statue of Simon Bolivar? Just what does he have to do with New Orleans? So if there's no remaining logic for the presence of the Bolivar monument, perhaps there's even less of a raison d'etre for the cart Garden of the Americas and the, uh, its other two figures, Benito Juarez, president of Mexico from 1858 to 1872, and his Central American independentista counterpart, Francisco Morazan, president of the Federal Republic of Central America from 1830 to 1839. Though there is no evidence that Bolivar even visited New Orleans, Juarez lived in the city twice during two periods of exile, a topic you can hear more about if you come back here on April 8th to hear my colleague Yuri Herrera's talk, Juarez en Nueva Orleans, La ficción hecha de fragmentos de verdad. So it's his new novel uh, in progress. I encourage everybody to come. At this early stage in my research, I'm mostly just still articulating questions about the, this, these materials rather than generating answers. Uh, so some of those questions are, what was the impetus for this massive material and symbolic investment in inter-American identity in post-World War II New Orleans? What was the significance of the Garden of the Americas in an era in the era when these three statues were installed, and what meaning does it retain for us today? What does its demise suggest about the inter-American identity of New Orleans in our own times? Does its decline signal the erosion of the city's once celebrated position as gateway to the Americas as well? First though, given the context of these talks as a platform for research in progress, underline in progress, I also want to talk a bit about how I came to the topic and how it developed, how it's developed thus far. As often happens with our research, the work started as an abstract for a conference paper 
a conference presentation I assured myself would not distract me too much from the book manuscript I also have in the works, a manuscript uh, that for which the deadline has already been extended in the, from the uh, advanced contract. So to be perfectly frank, the idea for the Garden of the Americas research rests on a rejection. In my initial proposal for the 2022 Modern Language Association meeting held in New York this past January, I was hoping to talk about the Jewish lawyers, financiers, and weapons suppliers who backed revolutionary leader Jose Marti in the Cuban independence struggle. This inquiry into Marti's circle of New York based Jewish fixers, admittedly yet another tempting distraction from my book project, <laughs> seemed to dovetail nicely with the theme of the 2022 MLA, Multilingual US, a theme that could productively be read two ways, right? As either the multilingual United States or multilingual us. But that first proposal was rejected, in my opinion, unjustly, of course. Uh, so as they say, when at first you don't succeed, uh, I s went on to submit a second proposal for the MLA. In fact, I submitted an entire panel in response to the October call for, for just-in-time sessions. The just-in-time sessions are last-minute additions to the program designed to highlight hot-button issues in the academic and intellectual conversations of the moment. And one of those trending topics was, of course, still is, the monuments controversy in which New Orleans had been, been an early nexus. What did the presence, or perhaps better said, the absence of the Garden of the Americas in the monuments controversy signify? Was anyone considering the inherently bilingual nature of these monuments and their insertion in a formulation of the US, or of us, as also multilingual? For this panel, which we titled Multilingual Monuments in the Americas, I invited two colleagues to join me. Esther Allen from CUNY, City University of New York, agreed to speak about the twin Jose Marti equestrian monuments by sculptor Anna von Hyatt Huntington, situated in New York's Central Park and near the intersection of the Avenue of the Americas and in Centro Havana. And I also topped our own Stone Center graduate student, Elena Manas Torres. Take a, take a bow. Take a stand. Take a bow. <laughs> um, Elena is going to present on the 360 foot high bronze statue, bronze monstrosity of Christopher Columbus, known as the birth of the new world, installed on the Atlantic coast of Puerto Rico, Arecibo. So our collective aim with this session was and is to analyze these fraught monumental landscape projects in 20th and 21st century Puerto Rico, New Orleans, New York, and Havana as material and discursive proofs of transterritorial and multilingual negotiations of inter-American identity that at the same time reveal local realities of racial, socioeconomic, and linguistic conditions in the communities in which they are situated. Our session was accepted, woohoo! And we were all excited to convene for our in-person panel at the MLA in New York, but that too had to wait. Besides the problem of the pandemic itself, my husband Eduardo was in a serious accident just days before we were scheduled to travel, and the MLA panel was postponed until 2023. So if you're gonna be there, I invite you to come here about this topic in this larger and no doubt richer context of multilingual monuments in the Americas. Maybe this could be an edited volume or something down the line after the book is turned in, right? So thinking about how I got interested in this research, I should also acknowledge that in some senses it sort of is a sequel to my 2021 book, Port of No Return, Enemy Alien Internment in World War II New Orleans, in which I focused on the United States efforts to apprehend and detain thousands of persons deemed dangerous enemy aliens in Latin America between December of 1941 and the end of World War II. Besides offering the principal port through which these men, women, and children passed en route to de detention camps throughout the US, New Orleans also boasted its own detention facility, Camp Algiers, located on the west bank of the Mississippi. A couple thousand of these Latin American detainees deported to the U.S. were held at Camp Algiers, including a unique group of Jewish internees who were concentrated at the New Orleans site after being held alongside Nazi sympathizers in other U.S. detention camps in the U.S. South. 
The monuments projects, the, this monuments project proves I'm not quite done yet with our port of no return, I guess. I'm assuming that all of three of these statues destined for the Garden of the Americas also passed through it before they stood them up on Basin Street. Yet another source of inspiration has been the recently concluded Sawyer Seminar, um, um, sponsored by Tulane's Newcomb Art Department, the School of Liberal Arts, and the Mellon Foundation, titled Sites of Memory, New Orleans, and Place-Based Histories in the Americas. The Sawyer posted a series of hosted a series of provocative presentations and site visits, which offered me new angles from which to approach the Garden of the Americas project. One of the seminar speakers, Lorraine Liu, professor of Spanish and Portuguese and African and African, African American studies at UT Austin, was gracious enough to uh, walk through the Garden of the Americas with me, explore with me from her own area of expertise on the symbolic value of the built environment in urban resistance efforts in Brazil. And finally, the Latin American Library itself has played a hand in stoking my curiosity on this topic. LAL featured the Garden of the Americas in case four of its Pan American Life in New Orleans exhibition, inaugurated in November of 2019. Many of you will remember this lovely depiction of New Orleans as the Eje del Hemisferio Occidental on the left. The exhibition also included this photo of the Bolivar statue um, uh, on Basin Street, which was featured on the cover of the Sunday magazine of the Times Picayune for March 26, 1961. And I would say that this photo shows us that the Garden of the Americas and especially the Bolivar Monument itself had within a few years of its installation become an iconic symbol of this Pan American life. The exhibition text noted, and I quote, through the 1960s and to a lesser extent the 1970s, New Orleans continued to aggressively market itself to more affluent Latins as a prime destination for travel, business, cultural exchange, education, and pleasure. Perhaps no other single person was as instrumental in this endeavor as four-time Mayor de Lesseps' story, Chep Morrison. He was mayor from 1946 to 1961, who served as a promoter and amb ambassador of all things Pan American. Morrison, who once declared that he was, in his soul, a Latin American, made the pursuit of trade and cultural exchange with the region the cornerstone of his administrations. Described by one of his biographers as probably the best known United States citizen in Latin America, the four-time mayor was indeed the driving force behind such initiatives, but as we shall see, far from its only proponent. As a monumental landscape dedicated to Latin American leaders, we might compare New Orleans Garden of the Americas project to New York's Avenue of the Americas, a stretch of Sixth Avenue in Manhattan along Central Park that Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia rechristened in October of 1945, accompanied by Chilean President Juan Antonio Rios. Besides the monument to Martí in Central Park, that section of the park also boasts a statue of Bolívar, and Jose de San Martin, the two great liberators of South America. We could also consider parallels with monumental series of proceres within Latin America and the Caribbean, such as Havana's Avenida de los Presidentes, along Calle G in the Vedado neighborhood, which also boasts monuments to Bolivar and Juarez, amongst other Latin American leaders. Both of these statu statuary landscapes are still important landmarks though the Castro government pruned its own garden-like path of the presidents, removing the bronze statue of Tomás Estrada Palma, the first president of the republic from 1902 to 1906. So you have here the Palma, the original Palma, and then here he's been removed. Um, for the revolutionary Barbudos, Estrada Palma was a traitor, not a liberator, a weak leader who had compromised Cuban independence and sovereignty by supporting decisions that prompted US political and military intervention in the island. So soon after the revolutionary triumph in 1959, Fidel and his followers removed the statue of Estrada Palma from its primary position amidst the presidential figures stretching along Calle G. Ironically, Palma's shoes, Estrada Palma's shoes remained behind. You can sort of see it right there. Um, on the statue's pedestal, creating for some 
an apt metaphor of the unfilled shoes of truly democratic leadership in Cuba. As mentioned, the Garden of the Americas was the brainchild of a group of Latin-leaning New Orleans civic leaders headlined by Mayor Chet Morrison himself. But arguably, long before the 1957 dedication of the Bolivar Monument, Morrison was already on his Latin American mission. I think I have the book. So this is Morrison's Latin American mission. It's his memoir. Um, it's a little bit tragic because the book was published posthumously in 1965, the year after he and his son died in a um, um, airplane accident in Mexico. Um, let's see. Arguably, oh yeah, we, we did that. Uh, he was already on his Latin American mission as the title of his posthumous memoir declared and I'm citing Morrison here, by vocation I am a lawyer and politician, but my avocation has been and is Latin America, he wrote in that volume. In fact, throughout his long tenure as mayor and well before being appointed ambassador, the first ambassador, in fact, to the Organization of American States by President John F. Kennedy in 1961, Morrison earned a reputation as a tireless champion of the Latin tinge of New Orleans. He traveled to Latin America and the Caribbean on numerous occasions, meeting with scores of leaders ranging from El Jefe Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic to Juan Domingo Perón in Argentina. As part of this mission, he instituted a long list of America's friendly initiatives and projects, of which the Garden of the Americas then is only one item. Nor was Morrison the first to express these sentiments. Thomas Griffin wrote in his 1961 volume, New Orleans, a guide to America's most interesting city. New Orleans was a Latin city a century old before it became part of the United States. Griffin heralded the city as, quote, the gateway for the Midwestern area of the United States, two ports in Central and South America, the West Indies, and the world. Its docks are always lined with ships flying foreign flags. Every day, sailings carry, carry visitors to and from the Caribbean via cruise or cargo vessels and airplane flights are numerous to the romantic islands of the West Indies. So known as a charismatic figure who spoke Spanish and marched into the formal word world of Latin American protocol with a directness, a freshness, a complete lack of pretense that overwhelmed his colleagues, Chef Morrison was a missionary, even an evangelist, for New Orleans as the axis of the hemisphere and the gateway to the Americas. In his introduction to Latin American mission, uh, the, Gerald Frank wrote that Morrison was brash, unafraid, and unorthodox in his dealings with Latin Americans, but he liked them. He meant well for them, and they knew it. They responded, the vast majority of them, to their chepito with the same open affection he exhibited toward them. Chepito, Chet Morrison, chepito. <laughs> These photos were two of the publicity shots released for Morrison's inauguration in 1946. In the first, we see a long line of cars waiting to participate in his inaugural parade, starting, it appears, from the foot of Canal Street. In the second photo on the right, we can see that each car is draped with the name of a Latin American country, in this case, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, and Colombia. Did everyone in these cars travel uh, from these places? Um, to represent their countries? We don't know, but the visual message is still remarkable and nearly unthinkable in our own times. Plus, these are awesome cars, right? Maquinas. While the Garden of the Americas may have been his idea, Morrison only lived to see the first of the three monuments installed. It was at the ceremony for the Bolivar dedication, in fact, that the city unveiled the Garden of the Americas, a, quote, landscaped swath of Basin Street neutral ground that in addition to the Bolivar statue includes seven flagpoles, one for the flag of each of the six Bolivarian countries and one for the U.S. flag. A November 15, 1957 press release from the mayor's office announced, New Orleans on November 24th will pay tribute to the memory of Simon Bolivar, the great South American hero and patriot, with the dedication of a handsome and imposing monument, capital M, erected in his honor. The monument, capital M, is located on famous Canal Street and is a gift to the city from the Republic of Venezuela. 
It consists of a standing figure of the renowned liber liberator who is known as the George Washington of South America, set in a beautifully landscaped plaza with walkways, a fountain, and reflecting pools. Mayor de Lesseps S. Morrison has urged the citizens of New Orleans to attend the dedication ceremony to, quote, express our gratitude to the government of Venezuela for their generosity in building this beautiful monument in the heart of our city and to reaffirm the warm and enduring ties of friendship existing between New Orleans and Latin America, end quote. Another announcement released five days later from the Public Relations Office at City Hall mentioned a parade scheduled to begin at 4 p.m. and included a list of the Venezuelan military and diplomatic delegates who would be in attendance. William P. Snow, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, would also be on hand to represent the United States. The Most Reverend L. Abel, L. Abel Cuayot, Cuayuye, Auxiliary Bishop of New Orleans would deliver the invocation and Mario Bermudez, who we've already met, Director of International Relations for the City and International House would serve as MC. <coughs> Members of the Tulane University Air uh, ROTC cadets were tapped to form an honor guard at the monument and the police department band would provide the music. So designed by Venezuelan architects and engineers and cast in granite in Italy, by Venezuelan sculptor Abel Valmitjana, the, the Bolivar Monument was described as, quote, modern in appearance. It weighed seven tons, I guess it still weighs seven tons, <laughs> and rested on a cantilevered platform five feet high, which was covered with iron ore, representing the mineral riches of Venezuela. This is all very weird now that we're talking to Venezuela again, and you know we're friends with Venezuela again so that we can get their gas, uh, their petroleum. At the time of its dedication, viewers could approach the standing figure via, via a sweeping ramp that crossed over the reflecting pools below. In addition, the flags and national emblems of each of the six nations for which Bolivar was known for liberating, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and Panama, formed part of the monument together with the United States flag. The Basin Street Neutral Ground was officially designated the Garden of the Americas by the city government with the expectation that other Latin American nations would erect monuments to their national heroes there as well. So this could have been bigger. I don't know. No one know what happened. But. Griffin described the statue of Bolivar, the only one that had been erected in 1961 and when his guidebook came out as quote, tangible evidence of how New Orleans rates as a good neighbor to Latin America, end quote. More of this tangible evidence would follow with the installation of the Juarez mon monument in 1965. It bears the inscription, peace is based on the respect of the rights of others in English, a translation of Juarez's own declaration that el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz, which he reportedly pronounced in July of 1867 after entering Mexico City following the defeat of Maximilian and the Second Mexican Empire. There's some debate in the historical literature as to whether or not Juarez was also paraphrasing a similar expression by Immanuel Kant. In any case, the bronze plaque was added in, a bronze plaque was added in 1972 on the centennial of Juarez's death, suggesting continued engagement with the symbol with the monument. The statue of Francisco Morazan, the least familiar name amongst these three, right? Did anybody know who Francisco Morazan was? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, and the least cited in references to the Gardens of the Americas was de dedicated in 1966, as we see on the corresponding bronze plaque here. There is another round brass plaque that reads, Provincias Unidas del Centro de América within a pyramid or triangle. And I've provided a close-up here as well on the right bottom of the Phrygian cap. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, please. Phrygian. Phrygian, thank you. Phrygian cap or liberty cap, which also appears on the plaque. The Phrygian cap, in the, which is also in the Cuban coat of arms. Yeah. The Phrygian cap, um, it, which appears in representations of a variety of other republics, signifies freedom from the crown, which typically would appear in emblems of countries still subject to monarchies and imperial governments. 
In 2013, in an article on Morrison's lasting impact on New Orleans, published in uh, 64 Parishes, authors Glenn Jeanson and David Lurson mentioned the Garden of the Americas project, but left out the Morrison monument. Poor Francisco Morrison. Always sh short shrifted on this. They also noted that the renowned sculptor Lynn Emery had, le had created another monument in 1966. This went to Mayor uh, Morrison himself, installed in the Civic Center, whose construction he spearheaded. They, they wrote in this article, quote, although Morrison rapidly lost political influence after stepping down as mayor, his legacy in New Orleans remains significant even today. The municipal government continues to operate under the city charter he implemented in 1954, and many of the public works and monuments erected during his administration, including the Union Passenger Terminal, City Hall, the Civic Center Complex, the widening of Basin Street, and statues honoring Benito Juarez and Simon Bolivar remain part of the city's landscape. Today, however, these monuments languish in various states of disrepair or neglect, with the Bolivar statue in the worst shape of the three. The base and surrounding platform for the statue are crumbling, and Bolivar now looks out at us almost Dracula-like. <laughs> Perhaps a Dracula dressed up in a Mardi Gras costume of a 19th century Latin libertador. It's not uncommon to see drug paraphernalia at Bolivar's feet, which were spray painted red at one point. And as we see here, the platform for the statue has been tagged by grafiteros. What does the ojos message? So here, this is the base of the statue, and you have the graffiti of ojos. What does the ojos message tell us? Should we read it as the Spanish equivalent of the open your eyes messages that adorn several other New Orleans urban canvases? So this huge building here with the eyes, and then this here says, open your eyes. <clears throat> Though I am not an expert on New Orleans, uh, not Richard Campanella, or on monuments, or on Bolivar, Juarez, Morazan, or the other Libertadores, as a Latin Americanist, I'm convinced that the forlorn and forgotten Garden of the Americas is noteworthy for its very absence from important discussions of the key symbols of New Orleans' contemporary urban landscape. So to conclude, I want to return to some of my earlier questions, perhaps slightly reformulated. Why were these statues virtually ignored in local efforts to dismantle mon monuments to the Confederacy and other historical narratives resting on doctrines of white superiority? What might the disregard for the Garden of the Americas signal in relation to the city's historic claim as a unique environment for a multiracial and multilingual Creole or Criollo culture? What does its seeming demise mean in the context of New Orleans self-promotion as a multicultural gumbo? To what should we be opening our eyes? <laughs> we would do well to bring this monumental project into the frame, I believe, alongside the Robert E. Lee statue and the other Confederate figures removed in 2017 amid, on the one side, local citizens demanding take them down NOLA, and on the other, Confederate flag-bearing antagonists insisting that local authorities keep them up. It's true that the uh, <clears throat> monuments in the, Gardens of the America, in the Garden of the Americas do not appear in C.J. Hunt's provocative new 2021 documentary, The Neutral, Neutral Ground. How many have seen it? Fantastic documentary on the um, monument. Yeah. Screening You're screening it. April. Okay, good. Um, which reflected on the New Orleans Monuments controversy from several different angles. Hunt's film, which aired a few months ago on PBS's Point of View and will soon be shown at Tulane in April, did not include the Basin Street Neutral Ground along which our Libertadores languish, even though it's called the Neutral Ground, even though the documentary is called that. In fact, I'm still trying to figure out uh, whether these monuments are even included in the massive monuments project. This, this image on the right on the bottom is, is from that website. Um, how many of you know about the monuments project? Yeah, a couple, few people. The art history people know. Um, a kind of census, correct me if I'm wrong on this, a kind of census of US statuary and monuments 
the, the Monuments Project itself has been funded by the Mellon Foundation to the tune of $25 million. Uh, not, not so with the Garden of the Americas. It seems instead that the Garden of the Americas has been untended in both physical and discursive terms, suffering from indifference on both counts. It simply has not been part of the discussion, but perhaps it should be. Thank you.